Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the uh, Madison City Council meeting. Today is Tuesday, August the 17th. You'll see that we've got a little bit different setup here in council chambers just to recognize the uh, reemergence or resurgence, I guess, of uh, COVID. So we have uh, uh, allowed our council persons to um, separate, and we've also separated our seats here in, uh, in council chambers to take take preventative measures. We are streaming and recording tonight on City Madison YouTube channel. We have a uh, pretty interesting agenda. We'll start by uh, uh, standing, removing our hats, and reciting the Lord's Prayer and Pledge of Allegiance, then we'll get into the agenda. Thank you. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, clerk, may we have a roll call, please? Yes. Dan Dillo? Here. Lucy Dillo? Here. Bartlett? Here. Chatham? Here. Rampy? Here. Kevin All? Here. Here. Thank you. Council, uh, have you had an opportunity to review the minutes from August 3rd meeting? I'll we'll entertain a motion to approve them if there are no modifications. I move we approve the minutes as submitted. All second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to um, our uh, resolutions or bills and ask. Uh, uh, City Attorney Jenner to go through those two ordinances with us. Council, if it's okay, I'd kind of like to just do these in kind of combination. They are mirrored ordinances. The only difference is the first one is establishing a non reverting fund for Indiana Humanities Grant, and the other is establishing a non reverting fund for the National Trust Grant. So basically, those two titles are the ones that are in change. So I'm just going to read one of them. That's okay. Jim, so, can we have the numbers? Yep. Ordinance number two or twenty twenty one dash twelve and is the one for Indiana Humanities Grant Non Reverting Fund. And ordinance number twenty twenty one dash thirteen is the one for the establishing a non reverting fund for National Trust Grant. Thank you. Whereas the State Board of Accounts in their June 2020 Cities and Towns Bulletins has stated that a separate fund for each grant is required. And whereas the City of Madison has entered into a grant sub-award agreement with the Indiana Humanities Council. And whereas the City of Madison wishes to establish a fund in order to deposit funds and pay expenses related to the Indiana Humanities Grant. Now therefore be it ordained by the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana as follows. That an account as established for the purpose of depositing monies from a granting agency appropriations from the cities and counts from any lawful source pay the required obligations for the city of Madison on to accept the grant. The account shall be named the Indiana Humanities Grant Non-Reverting Fund and that all funds contained in the account shall be expended only for the pur exclusive purpose of paying the expenses related to the grant. The account shall be a non-reverting and existing perpetually unless terminated by a subsequent ordinance enacted by the Common Council and then if the account is terminated by a subsequent ordinance enacted by the county council, the remaining balance of the terminated account shall revert to the general budget of the county council. Thank you. So those are both on first reading, and they will go on to the second reading at the next meeting. And I'll just mention that, uh, as you know, this is required as part of the uh, guidelines with state board accounts so that we separate uh, grant funds in, in a separate fund when we receive them. Okay, council, are there any reports, uh, recommendations, or other business from any standing or select study committees of city council? 
All right, hearing none, I'd like to invite uh, Parks Director Matt Wooler to give the council and the mayor's office a uh, report on parks. <clears throat> uh, we're going to be hitting on programming, Sunrise Golf Course in Crystal Beach, since that's been primarily the focus here these past months or two. Uh, with programming, we've got a lot that's going on right now. Uh, first and foremost, we've hired Chad Ison as our programming coordinator. Uh, he's doing a fantastic job. He is handling all youth, adult, and uh, senior activities, all of that pertaining to programming. Um, and his work ethic and energy is really just kind of um, Kind of rejuvenating all of us and he's doing a fantastic job with that so I look forward to some big things from him in the future what we've got going on programming wise right now uh, youth volleyball registration is open practices will be held Tuesday and Thursdays throughout September with games also on Tuesdays and Thursdays throughout October um, as we speak right now Peter Prio Cannon the head uh, volleyball coach for Hanover College is currently hosting a camp that is in partnership with the kids that signed up for our leagues um, they had it last night and they're having it again tonight and we had 32 participants for that. Um, so we're excited about that turnout and look uh, to match what we did last year. For youth football, registration is still open for flag. Currently have 39 participants signed up and games for that will begin on August 28th doing a similar kind of format where um, the head football coach, Leroy Wilson, uh, he's getting his varsity players together on Saturday mornings. And with those kids that are signed up, they're getting to do the drills on the field with the varsity players and then they get broken up into different teams each week. Um, and then the players get to you know, create their own plays for them and kind of help them through all the stuff. And so the kids really have a good time with that, getting to see all the kids, um, the high school kids on uh, Friday night, and then go out there and watch them and play with them on Saturdays. It's a lot of fun to see. Uh, tackle registration is currently closed for both of our leagues. We have fifth and sixth team, and then a third and fourth team. We've got 17 for our third and fourth, and 29 for our fifth and sixth. They just held um, our jamboree last weekend. We were in the, uh, the Hoosier Hills football conference again um, for our youth stuff, and our games will officially begin on August 21st. Our other youth activity is cheerleading. Registration is still open. Practices will be beginning next week, and we currently have 17 signed up for that. For our adults, what's coming up recently is uh, sand volleyball. Registration is open. This will be at the Sand Courts by the Bridge on September 4th, and this will begin at 11 a.m. Currently have two teams signed up for that. And the other adult one is Cornhole, which registration is open. This will be taking place at Johnson Lake on September 11th, beginning at noon. And then lastly for programming, uh, with our seniors. So our maintenance team has been working on uh, some repairs to our senior citizen building. That obviously was uh, used as our COVID center, so we've had that closed for quite a while. But we're finalizing a reopening plan for that, and we hope to have that back reopened um, within a couple of weeks. But we're just trying to take that precautionary with everything that's going on with COVID in the county. Uh, but that is one of our top priorities of getting that reopened. For Sunrise Golf Course, I'm going to kind of skip over the memberships. That's remained relatively the same for the past couple of months. Um, one highlight of that is with cart stickers, we have, despite raising the price $200, we have sold two more than we did last year. Um, so that's a positive note. Revenue has been pretty consistent as well. Something that has happened is underneath the, bar the park board, we've created a golf board now. Um, this four-person committee takes place the second Tuesday of every month at <coughs> Sunrise Golf Course at 5.30 p.m. And this is something that's open for the public. Um, and what their endeavor is, is really trying to generate more revenue uh, try to come up with more ideas just to get more volume on the course. Uh, we really don't have any issue right now selling those 8 a.m. to about noon tea times, uh, but anything after that has really been lackluster, and that's where we're going to be able to make up the difference. So one of uh, their first endeavors, because uh, we've had two meetings now, was coming up with some different fee structures to try to get more play in the afternoon. And so what just got passed at this last park board meeting, which was a recommendation from the golf board, uh, is that we are now have a senior veterans, first responders, and city employee rate of $28 with CART, but this is only on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And this again is just an effort to try to up uh, some, of our, some of our afternoon play and get a little bit more uh, volume on the course. And with that as well, the park board also passed a twilight rate, 
So this is going to be every day after 2 p.m. So your Monday through Fridays, that drops the price from $40 to $30. And then on weekends, it drops it from $45 to $35. And then also, with trying to get some more volume on the course, golf now is what we're going to change all of our tee times to, all of our POS, and then our reporting as well. Um, and so that is something that our head golf professional, Roger Gallatin, is very familiar with. He's had a lot of success with that in his uh, other place of employment, and so that's what we are going to transition to. And so that will begin installation on August 30th, and as long as everything goes smoothly, we should be live by September 3rd. Um, and so that's just going to be a more user-friendly way for the community and those outside the community to be able to find Sunrise Golf Course um, and be able to uh, book tee times in a matter of seconds. And with that too, Golf Now is going to create our own website. Um, as long as everything goes through with this, the park board and the golf board agreed on sunrisefallsgc.com. Um, having an online presence is something that the golf course has never really had. If you were to search Sunrise right now, you might see a couple Google reviews, uh, maybe a golf advisor review, but nothing really pertaining to Sunrise Golf Course. So we think this is another way that we can generate some of that outside play. Um, so if we get so many tourists, there's no reason that we shouldn't get more people into that course. Uh, and then lastly for our golf course, uh, big priority, if you haven't made your way up there yet, we've been, uh, been doing uh, some renovations to the inside of the pro shop. Um, so new paint, uh, new, uh, new flooring, new furniture, new TVs, a little bit of everything that's been set up so that hasn't been done in a couple of decades at least. Um, the whole idea of that is to make it a more family friendly place and get not just your golfers in there, but the kids, um, the spouse, whoever that may be, get it in there and make it a more event space uh, that the whole family wants to go um, be at. So right now we are currently looking uh, to get the grill operational before the end of the year. Um, and that's been our, uh, our main task there with Sunrise Golf Course. But right now it's been difficult to find some labor. And then with Crystal Beach, we just finished up our pool season. Uh, so hit a couple highlights with our pool. Swim lessons, which we didn't hold last year due to COVID came back very, very strong this year. In June, we filled up 71 of our 100 spots. And then in July, we filled up 99 of our 100 spots. So with that, I have a couple of thank yous uh, to the people that made this season possible. Our head lifeguard and swim lesson instructor, Katie Royce. Our assistant managers, Lake Lambert, Molly Baker, and Ashlyn White. And then our manager, Haley Courtney. Uh, between the four of them, with they're all working other jobs and whatnot, um, and then with the weekend work, they really did an excellent job of managing the entire pool, uh, keeping it all safe with COVID, um, with the new things that we've got in place. Uh, they really just did a fantastic job and worked together very, very well. I'm also pleased to announce that this past season, in 61 days of operation, Crystal Beach had 13,098 guests total. So that is 90 less than we had of all of last year, but we did it in less days, so we were seeing almost 20 uh, additional guests per day this year. And so we expect that number to increase as we progress and as we get through these renovations. One of our big successes with Crystal Beach was our water aerobics. Uh, we couldn't do that without our two volunteer instructors, Chris and Diane. They've been doing this for the past several years, uh, and that's something that we've just seen to continue to grow and grow. We had 73 season pass holders for water aerobics. And with our daily pass, the people that showed up just to try it out, we had over 1,100 participants throughout the entire uh, summer to be able to take part in that. So very special thank you to everyone who participated in that, and we hope to see everybody back uh, once our renovations are finished. And then lastly, with the renovations that are going on, uh, we've got that $2.5 million uh, grant that, is many, that we are currently um, undergoing. Supplies have been ordered. Uh, Keep Leatherman has been very, working very hard on getting uh, the entire pool cleaned out, both the pool house because that entire structure is being renovated and then the pool itself. Um, so that is now finally um, almost ready to go. That's just a, a lot of work for one person to try to get done. So we look for the, that work to begin here in just a couple of weeks. Is there any questions? I just want to mention that uh, creating an on online uh, presence for Sunrise is really, really beneficial. And then that's also pivoting off of Rec Desk, which we adopted uh, earlier this year, late yes, last January. year, which really helped us uh, 
better facilitate transactions in the parks department for the different programs and signups for for parents and their kids. And we've processed processed literally thousands of transactions through rec desk, which otherwise would have been done manually. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's uh, continue with the report of city officials. Our deputy mayor, Minnie McGee, gives an update on a few things, including Main Street traffic on the plan. Good evening, Council. I'm going to try and get technology working while I talk to you. Um, I wanted to, I'll give my update first while I do all this. Jenna Armstrong is, uh, wanted to update you on Jenna. She was my summer intern, and you all um, know that I was going to put her in budget full time for 2022. So we went ahead and hired her as uh, HR generalist, and she uh, just graduated from Indiana State. She has her degree in HR management. So just wanted to tell you a little bit about what I've got her working on so far. Um, she, when she was here this summer, worked on a lot of things that were on my plate that I couldn't get to but really needed to be done. Um, she, very efficient, super smart. So. I had her continue on that when she started full time. She started last Monday, and just in that time, she has um, created uh, an online employee portal that we're finalizing and reviewing right now. So it will be an online place for employees to go <coughs> access any information they need about being an employee for the city. So the handbook, uh, benefit information, claim forms for their benefits, holiday schedule, payroll schedule, um, and then it, it provides a central location for internal policy uh, updates, the, just like we did one for COVID. And we she created org charts for every department, so those will be in there as well, which I don't believe we've had before. So um, I think that that will be very helpful for employees to be able to access everything without having to come down here and find somebody and, or know where it is so they can print it off. And um, she currently is working on comparing, well, she started this when she was an intern too. She compared our current employee manual to our codified law in the ordinance book to find and identify conflicts. And there were some. So she's pulled those out. We're gonna, you'll hear more from me on that as we look at um, shoring those up so that we're not in conflict with ourselves. Uh, the other thing she just completed this week, or, or at least got a, a red line template for, is one of the things we've talked about in the past wanting to do is create a PTO bank. So a paid time off bank that if we get to the end of the year and employees have vacation time they can't take, sick time they won't need, uh, personal day they're not going to use, they can donate that time into a bank. And other employees, if they have a long-term illness or um, any kind of situation where they need to be off for a long-term situation and they run out of their own paid benefits, they can draw from that bank. Um, it's a way to keep them paid longer when they have an unfortunate situation and need to be off. So she's created a policy and we're looking at putting parameters around it right now in terms of what you have to do to qualify to apply from it, how much you can do, how long you can use the benefit and that sort of thing. But really good start on what I think will be a nice benefit for our employees. Uh, budget. So since we all met in, in session for workshop, I have uh, finalized all the changes that we talked about and uh, made just a few other adjustments. And then we had our preliminary meeting with DLGF a couple of weeks ago to review the revenue the expenses and our projected budget for 22. So that information, uh, that went well. We're within our bounds on ter in terms of tax levy information, but uh, we, we may have to make some adjustments around where we pull, but we're, we're within our uh, tax levy for that, so that looks good. Um, the last thing I wanna do before I come back before you with budget is double check on my calculations because um, I did those pretty quickly, and as we were moving employee benefit stuff into the appropriate departments, I just want to make sure that those numbers are correct. So 
uh, they may change a little bit at, if I find errors. And then we probably need to have a another meeting, just a quick meeting, where we can review all those changes. And I don't think it'll take terribly long, but uh, just so we're all on the same page before we go to first reading, which is September 7th. So uh, sometime between now and then we need to get together. I will send you out an email and um, we'll work through dates that, that will work for everybody. I'd like to do it before a council meeting, but that's the next one. So, um, we'll so have September 7th. That's first reading. <clears throat> okay. And I think we're ready to move on. So. I wanted to give you all an update on the road project that we're about halfway in the middle of. The, um, sorry. <laughs> Type in my password. So we are in uh, the middle of the <coughs> summer maintenance plan. They have finished <coughs> all of the paving patches all the way to Hanover Hill. So one thing I wanted to inform council of is at the top of Hanover Hill, the little spur that is 256, the start of 256, when you go up and it goes to the right, like you're gonna go over to two edges, it's about a quarter of a mile, I think. That That is our road, that's a local road. We had it in our plan to just do some crack seal on that. INDOT has a project going right now where they are resurfacing Highway 62 right across there and they meet and they have milled on I think the west side of, of 62 on 256 but then they jumped across and milled our section of 256 and they did the whole section. So I worked with INDOT to find out what happens now and uh, the good answer is that they have to pay that road back for us. So instead of just crack seal, we're gonna get a brand new road on at least that quarter mile section at no cost to us. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. I wanted to let you know that that's how that happened. Okay, so next round, uh, phase two of this project will be, uh, we'll start the week after Chautauqua. So, my notes. I just want to talk a little bit about how that's going to work and what we're going to do is have some open houses um, because there are going to be a lot of questions about this just because it's a little bit more complicated <coughs> than just doing the patching work because we are going to have to close some access to the roads. So I'll just give you a brief overview and then we'll get dates out for the open house and we can just really dive into whatever questions people have. We're also going to be working directly with business owners on Main Street because it is going to affect their business for a day. Um, but the next crew will come in, they'll start the day, the week after, they're targeting the day after Chautauqua on that Monday, about always depends on weather, but they'll go through and do a crack seal and then a mastic application, which is for the deeper cracks. They'll do that all the way to the Crooked Creek Bridge and turn around and come on the south side. Just like we did the first time, they'll only be working on the north side, then they'll come back and work on the south side, so we'll have two-way traffic open just like we did. That'll be normal, they expect that to be nine to 12 days worth of work. Then uh, they'll come back and start working on the liquid road application. This is where it'll get a little, little bit tricky. So the liquid road application is a two-step process. They'll come through, um, lay it down and it needs to dry for a couple of hours, then they'll come back and do it again. And again, it needs to dry for a couple of hours at least, but probably a little bit more than that because it's gonna be twice as thick. They wanna make sure that it really has time to set up before anybody drives on it. So the problem will be at intersections, alleys, and driveways, they're not gonna be able to drive across it. So instead of being able to keep those intersections open so people can still move through and around, we're not gonna be able to do that. In the sections that they're working, it's going to be no parking and no, no crossing over that roadway once they lay that product down. Um, I asked what happens if somebody does that, if somebody drives across it while they're applying. 
and if it's during the first coat, it's fine, but if they dry across before the second coat dries, it's there forever. So we're gonna work really hard to not inconvenience any more than necessary, but still get a good product down. So I will put this all in detail, and then we'll do storyboards and have an open house and work directly with business owners as much as possible so everybody knows what's happening. Uh, we'll make adjustments for deliveries on side streets as much as we can. Um, but again, whoever it affects, that section that they're doing is just one day. So hopefully we can all deal with one day. <laughs> okay. And then last thing is I have a little presentation for you on striping. So after they finish the liquid road application, they'll come back in and restripe everything. So there, there will not be any changes to striping Central Business District and west of Craigmont. That's going to go back the same way it is now in terms of striping. What we're going to do, though, is try something new between Broadway and Craigmont. So that's an area where we have a lot of traffic. It's a lot of fast traffic. There's a school in the middle of it, some businesses, some residential. Um, and I've got some data to show you um, the speeds that are taking place in there. So we are going to move that to a three-way or a three-lane road, which will be one lane east, one lane west, turn lane in the middle. So I'll show you how all of that will work and what that will look like. And again, this will be part of the open house project that we do. Drag it to the left or right, the whole thing? Mm -mm. It's like it's not um, connected to that. Or you could get to do it. Yeah, you Okay, so we worked with, we are working with Ratio Architects on the long-term plan for Main Street. And as a part of that, they came in and did a traffic study for us and gave us the data that came from that traffic study. It's a typical day, I think they did 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. midweek. So we know there's room on weekends and uh, during festival weekends where it's gonna be much more than that. There's gonna be days where it's slower than that, but it was a good sort of mid-week check on it. So they were able to give us some really good um, information based on that traffic study and other data that they provided. So if you look at the red section on the far right, that is from Jefferson Street over to just past West. And that showed about a little over 12,000 vehicles that day between those hours in just that section. And uh, if you look down at the bottom of the graph below that, so there's several things that that is showing you. The light blue and the orange line are speeds. So, um, sorry, I think I told you wrong. It's a gray line and the orange line that are speeds. So reasonable, 25-ish is about the highest, a little, little closer to 30 maybe, and then, um, the other, the light blue and the dark blue are the volume, that's the number of cars, so obviously that is higher. 
The next section to the left is, is the main section of Main Street with about 7,100 cars to 9,000 cars during that section. And the data below for that, if you look at the speeds on that, that is the orange and gray line. Those go above 50 miles an hour in that section. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us who live downtown know that's true. But that's what, 20 miles over the speed limit mm -hmm. in that area? Right. Right. <coughs> okay, this graph is what Ratio was working with us on evaluating whether it made sense or would be appropriate for us to move from a four lane to a three lane. And looking at the data that <coughs> they used, this is what the restriping, this is a little box of what the restriping would look like. So right now is what we have below, the two lanes each way. The one above would be one lane each way with turn lane in the middle. This is evaluating the average daily traffic and size of the road. So it puts us right in the middle if you look at um, <coughs> the accesses, the, the daily traffic, we're right there in the middle of the pink box, which is obviously the largest um, option for us as a three lane with a right turn lane and shoulders. This is showing the three lane again and based on our average uh, traffic numbers, we come in at the bottom end of that bar, which means that's how much room we have to grow up to, I'd say about 18,000 cars would carry us within that same three lane configuration and I don't know if we go from 12 to 18,000 maybe on Chautauqua, but um, so we are at the bottom end of that recommendation. Hey, Manny, back yes. up on that one just a second. I'll sure. just make an observation here, which is uh, the east and the west ends are already two lanes. So you indicated that the east end of Main Street, which is a two lane road, handles over 12,000 cars a day. That's Highway 421 coming off the bridge. It's almost two lanes the entire way from Carrollton frankly, Highway 421. Uh, the west end of Main Street, the traffic drops from 12,000 down to a little over 7,000, and that's two lane. So what we're saying here, taking the middle part, which is primarily residential, and um, <coughs> reducing the, the lanes from four to three, we call that a traffic calming or giving it a road diet because it's really needed, uh, we can still handle more volume of cars than what's on it now and you could almost look at it and say those, that three-lane configuration is much better than the two-lane configuration that's on the east and the west ends of, of Main Street. <coughs> uh, that's the observation I take, take from this, which is you can make this uh, stretch of road safer uh, for, for all traffic and pedestrians, uh, different forms of, of, uh, of mobility. And as compared to the east and the west ends, you can handle more volume, frankly, in a more organized way. And what I think you're about to show is that it doesn't really slow your commute time because it's a more efficient way to move traffic. So this is, and keep in mind, when we ask Ratio to start this study, we ask them to look at changing to a three-lane road all the way from Jefferson through the whole footprint. So all this data, all the data we've looked at so far, is taking into consideration <coughs> the entire stretch of roadway, not just the smaller section that we're looking at doing this with. And even looking at the entire pass-through, um, these are the amounts of delay that it would cause to go to three lanes as opposed to four. So um, if you look at the highest peak, like the PM hour uh, at Craigmont, it would it's a 15 second delay going to 23. So uh, it's an eight second difference. Um, you, you can look at those other numbers. It's just not a significant increase in time. And th again, this is over the entire footprint, not just one section of it. So I just wanted to show that estimation on their part. And then this is what um, they provided us with you know, their thoughts on moving to this four to three lane conversion. So uh, they considered all of these things. They actually think we are a good 
candidate for making this change. <coughs> so uh, this is the most interesting piece of what they did. They took the actual traffic count data, vehicle data, and animated it for us so we can actually watch this traffic move through. So it takes a second to get it started. When you do, you'll start seeing traffic move um, through here. And then it will start breaking it down by intersection. I think it starts with Craigmont first. Um, and pay attention to the semi that comes down hanging around and <laughs> turns to the right. But uh, it is accurate. It is based on actual traffic. So um, I will try and talk a little bit through it as we go. But So that, I believe, is at uh, Jefferson Street to West. Interesting also that you see those semis coming off the bridge and turning north on 421, so that's working. This is the intersection at Main and Craigmont, so the bottom half of the screen is what it looks like now with that traffic pattern. The top is what it would look like if we switched. So you'll see that traffic back up right there a little bit, and then when the light changes, it all moves through. This is Main and Elm. And it just, just to confirm, we're not proposing to do anything in the central business district. No. So that was just for illustration purposes. Yeah. You know, again, what we're trying to do is really improve the, the safety between uh, Broadway and Craigmont, where it is a four-lane former <coughs> state highway that was uh, primarily responsible for moving cars. Uh, moving cars at whatever pace the cars go at. And this data, I think, is a sophisticated way to look at fact that cars are speeding uh, on average 20 miles over the speed limit at certain times a day. Uh, we can do this and make it safer for everybody. We're going to have wider parking stalls, bike lanes for multi-modal forms of transportation, and it's going to make that, that center stretch of road uh, consistent with the east and the west ends. Seems like the right thing to experiment with. We have an opportunity to do it now. Uh, as we are you know, making some uh, interim repairs on uh, Main Street, it's about a million dollars worth of work uh, that will get us then to uh, extending useful life to 2026 approximately when we have a $5 million federal highway grant uh, already, uh, already been awarded to the city. Can we have copies of the, the reports from the state? Absolutely, well, they, yeah, they're from, uh, they're from Ratio Architects, but yes. From Ratio? Mm -hmm. Which state reports do you want? Well, no, ratio is fine. I just want to see this report. It just, it just seems counterintuitive to me to take Main Street down to, really, it's one lane each way, right? The turn It'll lane. be one lane each way with a turn lane. So, so traffic will move out of the way for, for traffic that needs to go straight. It'll get sure, out of the way. but I'm talking about things like, you know, we, we're known for a festival city. We have lots of festivals. So what happens when other side streets are closed for those festivals? We really have one lane then going one way across all of downtown open. Is that correct? Well, except for central business will remain the same. Well, that's not that's not entirely accurate. So let's just use Chautauqua as an example. Okay. Uh, Main Street, totally wide open, correct? correct? And, and again, I'll just also point out that we're trying to solve a problem that's 365 days a year 
Uh, sure. Although there will be exceptions on a few days a year. But Chautauqua, as an example, is on the south side of Main Street. Okay. And uh, you can still come down uh, Main Street. Right. You can still uh, you can oh, still go down Craigmont and down Second Street. That's open. You can that way, and but you can't come back the other way. Uh, you True. Can, well, parts of Second Street will still be open. So, so in a, in the case of Chautauqua, it's not all of all of Second Street or all of Bond Street. It's parts of Second and parts of Bond. So there will be. And then what we're doing this year with Chautauqua uh, Couch Point is we're actually changing the flow of the Chautauqua Festival so that we can eliminate the bottlenecks that have been occurring on Main Street. So that that right now, their, their drop-off zone, for example, isn't on Main Street anymore. They're actually gonna be turning off of Main Street over to Elm, I believe it's Elm Street, is that, is that right? Elm Street, in order to make that a safer area. And then, and then the, uh, the, the drop-off bus will be able to then turn right and go back out of the, uh, out of the festival area. So, we're going to be working with those festivals so that that traffic flow is also safer uh, and, and moves the traffic, but also handles the amount of pedestrians that's going to be in the community. I, I think law yeah. enforcement on that weekend would help as well. Absolutely. We, we've never had that before. Yeah. It's a free flow. Yeah. So we actually are going to have different points where law enforcement is going to be at on um, second uh, at different points on Broadway and over on uh, I believe it is Elm Street and First Street or Elm Street and Vine Street so so we're going to do a combination of things to try to approach the traffic what we can't do is just assume basically leave it as it is honestly uh, because it's too dangerous I'll mention too that in the reports we received from the police department there's been 411 accidents on Main Street and it's a variety of things. Personal injury accidents were 25. This was over the last 10 years. Uh, leaving the scene was 153. Property damage accidents were 233. Uh, we have, it's mostly residential and school, so. So we're talking about, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah, Broad, Broadway to Craigmont. So we're talking about Broadway and Craigmont. That area have that many uh, This is from the corner of West Street to Craigmont. 10 years? Yeah, 10 years. What's 400. The, Okay. 411 accidents that were reported. Yeah. Oh, Wesley. Okay, West Street to City Limits. We also have um, had a tremendous amount of truck traffic on Main Street. You know, with the work that Council and Mayor's Office did last year, we changed our uh, traffic regulations to deal with heavy truck traffic, and that has moved approximately 2,000 heavy trucks off of Main Street that were weighing an average of four to six times our legal, legal weight limit. So it, there's been a whole concerted effort to get to where we are today and uh, with regards to traffic enforcement, ordinances and regulations, traffic studies, and to try to make this corridor safer. And if you're, if you're downtown at, at all times of the day, you'll see that, I mean, I think the data honestly is very <coughs> honest data, which is it's a lot of, a lot of speeding, um, very dangerous crosswalks, uh, dangerous for pedestrians and, and people on bicycles, and it's also dangerous if you park your car on Main Street. And this will, this will, this plan will, will alleviate that. The good news is we can experiment with this, and when we come back and do the main project in 2025, 20, 2026, 20, uh, we can tweak it, we can eliminate it, uh, we can add to it. We've got a lot of flexibility. I think it's a good yeah. test run. And what comes with this is also improved pedestrian safety through crosswalks. So even with this liquid road project that we're doing, we're going to light the crosswalks. We'll have lighted signage that's already been ordered. So um, by the library at Elm Street, uh, the next block down by the Christian Church, Right now, there's no signage, there's nothing, there's just painted crosswalks. And so, traffic doesn't look for people in the road. So, we'll have lighted signage that are warning, you're about to enter, you know, you're about to come up on a crosswalk area, pedestrians have the right of way. So, we'll have improved crosswalk and pedestrian safety with this too. Um, and we did have, we do have a steering committee that was put together made up of downtown residents, um, business owners, 
I'm not sure if we have Hilltop residents in that steering committee or not, but it's about 20 or so people that have, we think we've had three meetings so far with ratio, talking about design, but also going over this data. So um, I don't recall, Patrick, you're on that steering committee. I don't recall any negative conversations about if we made a change like this in a portion of the road, do you? Um, within the central business district, yes. I don't think we got into it too yeah. in depth for the I, rest. I think, I think that was loud and clear that people didn't more. want, and we have a lot of concerns about changing it in the central business district anyway, which we consider Broadway West to Jefferson. East. East. East thank you. Um, because we have trucks that need to deliver and things that need to happen, so we didn't want to interrupt any of that. But. I think the what what we've seen on the, the east end of town with the new bridge approach being one lane each way with the with the turn lane, it's worked out a lot better than, than a lot of folks would have mm -hmm. assumed. Um, and that's residential, just like everything west of uh, Broadway is more or less residential. So um, I think it's a good time to experiment, see mm -hmm. if it works. And I think that section of town's handling a lot more traffic than we would be here. Absolutely, and bigger traffic, and, and so this this will provide a little more safety to people parking their cars on Main Street. Mm -hmm. Do a little bit of a buffer between the, the lanes of traffic. Um, right. Was the traffic committee involved with this at all? Um, to Patrick's Patrick was invited as a traffic member. That's and one of the reasons that we put him on steering committee. So I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep asking questions. I just wasn't aware of yeah. any of this, so and I, I missed the last meeting, so that's on me. Well, that, no, 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 that's why we're bringing And that's why I was asking if the traffic well, committee was involved, just because, I mean, there's always an opportunity for them to present something to us after that, so I'm just trying to figure out, you know, where all the information was shared at. We're sharing it here. And, and so, maybe you said that the Could we get a copy before it's shared here, you know, like we do the other department reports and things? Well, this hasn't been, so we're sharing this with you now. We'll share any of the reports with you that you want, and then we're gonna do two open houses. The traffic committee doesn't even meet, rarely. So all the other traffic uh, issues that have come up have come through Board of Public Works, which is what we did here as well. <coughs> I, I don't think it's fair to say they don't meet. I think they've met more than probably any other committee and any time there's been an issue they've met. And I would have thought this would have been a good opportunity for them to meet. Well, I but that sound like they knew about it. Well, that's why we have we have the Main Street Steering Committee form, and that's why we're sharing this with you now, and all the other things with regard to striping, st uh, stop signs, uh, uh, handicap signs, issues that the chief brings up. They've all come through Board of Public Works. And so you said there would be two opportunities for yeah. the public to make right. comment. Mm -hmm. if, if we find this to be not what the public wants, does this continue on, or is this is this a done deal? Well, we're making this recommendation, and, and it's really going to be up to the Board of Public Works. So that's why we're also doing the listening sessions. We had this Public Safety Steering Committee. I'm sorry, we had the uh, Main Street Steering Committee. We've hired uh, an architect to firm to do the design and the research for us. That's why we're presenting you with the data. If there's data you think that hasn't been presented here, let us know what you'd like to see. I think it's pretty comprehensive myself. And now, and you also have certainly weeks to digest this. Yeah, so that I also wanted to mention that this striping won't happen until probably last week of September, first week of October, depending on weather. So we've got some time to get I, feedback. I, mean, I thought it was waiting until after Chautauqua. At the end of October. Are we not doing that this Chautauqua? Um, Isn't after, this taking it, place it's, after Chautauqua? It's after, it's after River Fest. No, striping oh. will happen after okay. Chautauqua. Okay, so well, we I thought, did I thought the, the liquid asphalt was going on after Chautauqua. That's correct. Okay. But they will not, that means we won't have it striped for Chautauqua. Well, yeah, so, yeah, that's that's one. So it'll be end, end of October rather than end of September. Um, they're going to come right back after Chautauqua and start striping. <coughs> so you're doing liquid asphalt after Riverfest? Mm -hmm. You said Chautauqua? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I guess we need a timeline. Yeah. Could. So um, Liquid Road starts September, I'm so sorry. So liquid Road starts September 13th. Um, expected to complete just before Chautauqua. Okay. And then they're starting the Crack Seal Mastic after Rip Fest. Those are the two festivals we're working on. So striping will not happen until after Chautauqua. Okay.
I uh, wanted to show you the transition. If we move to three lanes, we have to start that transition at some point. So the best, most logical place that we, when we've looked at it several different ways seems to be at Poplar. And that will be where signage starts notifying people that the center lane going west is turn lane only, left turn only. Then it'll be the right lane that travels on straight and you'll be in a, a, a three lane road at that point. So um, same thing coming back, we'll do that transition. It's actually already uh, happening down by Craigmont. So that will, and I think I have a, a graph of that. So, so this is typical striping for this. You'll see parking, you'll see curb parking, bike lane, driving lane, turn lane, and then on, on across the other way. The other thing that will happen is because we're reducing an entire lane, everything will be wider. So the drive lane will be wider, the parking will be wider. Um, you'll have that buffer with the bike lane between cars and, and parked cars and moving cars. So that's uh, basically what it'll look like. The bike lane then will be from uh, Craigmont to Broadway. So we'll have signage uh, notifying people of the start of the bike lane and the end of the bike lane, depending on which direction you're moving. <coughs> Excuse me, and this is how um, the striping will be west of Craigmont so that they can make that transition on into going east. That's all I had for you on that. So happy to share any and all of this with you. Take comments. We'll get the dates out for the open houses. Uh, hopefully tomorrow we're trying to get um, large storyboards done with all of this data so people can look at it. Any other questions from me or me on this? You're welcome. All right, we don't have any bills on third reading or second reading, so we'll move into uh, and councils or anything miscellaneous you'd like to bring up. There you go. All right, uh, before I get to the mayor's comments, we'll uh, open it up to the floor to see if there's any public comments. If anybody here would like to uh, address the mayor's office and city council, now's the time to do it. Just ask you to come to the podium. Uh, just be uh, succinct in your comments uh, and uh, identify yourselves. Hi, Julie Tavanoff, 761 West 3rd Street. And this might be more for Mindy. Is, did they, the ratio, ratio did this street thing. Did they take into account the traffic on Main Street at Lady Middleton when school lets out? Did they, I'm trying to remember what month they did the traffic study. I believe school was in session Well, my concern is, is um, if there are cars, part, there's like, what, an insurance company there and then two how, two or three houses. If there's cars parked in the, in the, where they're supposed to park, a lot of times these pickup people will just block one lane of traffic. So if we reduce to one lane of traffic, even though we're going to be wider, is this going to force people out into the turn lane, um, or is it going to force more people, more parents, or whoever's picking up their children to go on Third Street, which the school started back last week. I live in the 700 block of West Third, which is, what, three blocks from Lydia Middleton, and they've been backed up to my street. And I'm going to tell you that these, these parents don't move. They, they, they do not move out of the way. So, I don't, you know, I mean, that's my concern is it's going to be create a little bottleneck there at, when, when school's out. So. I actually, Julie, I think this is that's a good comment, and I'll, I'll address uh, Third Street in a minute, but I think this is a safer approach for the school. I'm, uh, and I'll, the reason I say that is that right now, I know, because I live across the street from Lynn right. they're not blocking Main Street. They are in the parking area. Um, and it seems like a lot of the traffic really gets diverted down Third Street, and yes. I was there the other day and it was backed up all the way to, to Craigmont. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's something that we need to explore with, with MPD. 
on a more efficient uh, pickup drop off sign. But on yeah. the main street side of things, I actually think this will be safer because they're going to have wider areas in front of Lydia Milton all the way up to the to that little street next to where uh, the Taylors live on the other side of the playground. Oh, where they're at the now. Time. Where they're at now. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I have, on, you know, come west on Main Street when, when these people start parking and they have been, you know, parked out. In they're the not way. supposed to block in I, the main, right. main Street. And I, I generally don't see them do that. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't an occasion where someone's doing it, but, you know, it's a school in, in the heart of town. And right. here what we're trying to do is slow people down, which, uh, which you know, intuitively would make things safer for people picking up children. Yes, I think. yes. And I'm, I'm not saying that I'm opposed yeah, to this. Yeah. I just want to see how it works. I don't really have an opinion until it go, you know, it goes in and see how it works. But th th those but are Third Street, things. you're right. I was, third Street's horrible. I was there the other day, and uh, uh, I ended up going down Presbyterian because it was backed up all the way and, to Craigmont. And now people are turning around and going the wrong way on Third Street when they realize that they can get there. I might ask the chief uh, who's here to maybe investigate that a little bit and see if there's not a better traffic uh, flow for uh, the pickup and drop off there at Third Street. Uh, you also have more kids yeah. being picked up as car riders than you've ever had too. Less kids are riding the buses. Yeah. And there's people, I mean, I was stuck on one of the side streets the other day picking my kids up. So you got people even going down Presbyterian and trying to come up alleyways and different things. It's it's worse <laughs> than I've seen it ever. How many buses did you say it's on Third Street? No buses, because the buses get there first. The buses get there first, and they pull up along the curb, and then all the parents start lining up. At 2.15, people start lining up in that parking lot. And by 2.30, it's just about to Craigmont. The school's not out till 2.50. I know buses are there waiting to pick up. That's blocked the entire street as well. So it's a two-fold situation. Yeah. I think there's got to be a better solution to that as well. I think that's a good point. <clears throat> this isn't really the best forum for going over all this, but earlier, I was late last year, early this year, I had brought up with you about perhaps a no parking between a certain time in front of the Liddy Middleton playground there in order to prevent people from having to line up into the lanes of traffic around cars or, or there's a van with a billboard that sits there sometimes. And, and I think that might be something that would help the road project restriping aside. It would help get the cars out of the lane of traffic from mm -hmm. like two to three or, or whatever pickup time needs to be in the morning. And, and perhaps that can help pull some of the traffic off Third Street because folks will know there's a place they can sit out of the lane of traffic off Main Street. But Chief, would you mind looking into that, please? Okay. I, I think we have turning off Main into the parking lot. We're looking for those back into the parking lot, right? So I think all the kids are picked up back there by the school limit. Correct. Yes, sir. Rick Reese, 1420 with Cherokee Court. Are bike lanes mandatory in street planning? They are, they're not mandatory. They're certainly recommended in, in urban planning now, city planning now, and, and they're almost always incorporated in any uh, in the in dot project. Which makes no sense whatsoever because the bicyclists are generally right smack dab in the middle of your lane and they don't need a bike lane because they're not going to use it, in my humble opinion. And, um, <laughs> and, the, and the idea, again, going back to, to Councilman Detell's point as far as going from four lanes to two, you're going to reduce, reduce speed just because you're choking off the traffic. We're not we're going to three. Three, whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so it's a more efficient. Two, and well, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a it's a big difference. So it's 50 percent more lanes, and uh, it, it is more efficient because now the the car that is turning can get out of the way, and the cars that are going straight can continue forward in a more efficient manner. You know, but you're decreasing the number of lanes by by 50 percent. Well, what I'm saying we we're not going from four to two; we're going from four to three. So I'm just making your but out, out your point on the west end, so you still got people going 50 miles an hour. Well, it should slow down. That's the thing. Well, I get it. It should slow down. You know, well, let me ask you this. So how come we can handle 12,000 cars on East End of Main Street, 
but we can't handle nine to seven thousand cars throughout the, the residential area. I think That's also a main issue. by what the hell's going on in the east end of town before you get on Milton Bridge, just like the, uh, the roundabout so that the hills. Uh, they can't figure the damn thing out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Twelve thousand. So I think it's novelty as much as anything. <coughs> People, uh, it used to be to be we believe, based on the data that we've compiled, this will slow the traffic down. And we already know, we already know that it's going 20 miles over the speed limit, and that's not safe. That's not a safe environment. I know, but it's yeah. Yeah. So if you can slow it down to the speed limit, hey, in an ideal world, people would follow the law, right? But they don't. They really don't. So you have to kind of, you have to try to help regulate it so that it gets closer to what the speed limit is. You're going to have to do that on Milltop then. You're going to have to do that on Cliffy. That would be safe. Uh, that's a state highway. This, right. Again, we, we uh, um, were able to transfer this road from a state highway to now a city street that goes to a residential neighborhood. It's it's got to be different than a state highway. Yeah. Thank you, though, Rick. I appreciate it. All right, anybody else? Yes, Wayne, you want to come up here? Wayne Angle, 505 Poplar Street. I just wanted to uh, say that I agree 100% with uh, Dewey about uh, down there on West Third with uh, all the parents or grandparents' cars backed up there every day. I was riding with a friend the other day and we got stalled there and had to sit and wait and wait and wait. And uh, you, you see the same thing up on uh, Michigan Road where Anderson School is and I mean I am sure that what they're doing picking their kids up is, is according to the law and all that I just I've just been curious for years as to why all these kids are not riding buses like we did when we were in school or I I did when I was in school, a lot older than me, but anyway, yeah, I'm assuming that's the way it was. And uh, but I, I think something does need to be done about that. Really. I think we've uh, identified that the uh, schools uh, create traffic patterns that we need to address. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's any easy solutions to those because well, they're uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, Lady Milton's on a one-way street, uh, mm -hmm. which also makes congestion. Higher, you know, particularly where the you know on the third street side where they're picking up and dropping off, sure. it's just not very efficient. You know, some problems can't be solved easily. Can be. No, they can't. Thank you, Wayne. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mark. Shelby Goldrie, fourteen eleven, the Telegraph Field. I think some of my question might have been answered. Uh, I have a question for the young lady in the back. This application that you're putting on the surface here in town, uh, that's a temporary goal. I think I heard in another meeting down the road several years, right? 20, uh, our 2025 fiscal year, the state of Indiana 2026 fiscal year, but we've been awarded a $5 million grant for a million pages. This temporary fix, uh, what kind of warranty or, or will this uphold through the winter months and stuff? scraping and salt and stuff like that? Well, it's used in many other cities. I have visited other cities and have the application around for several years. Um, it typically extends the life of a road surface by five to seven years. Based on the amount of traffic we have on Main Street, it won't last that long. Okay. We're just trying to extend the useful life because that road has not been maintained for a very, very long time, and it had a lot of damage to it because of a lot of the truck traffic in particular and the high volume. Okay, as far as the roundabout on the hilltop, it just wasn't made bigger. No, nobody, if they hadn't driven in big cities, knows how to use the roundabout. It, it works if everybody knows how to use it. Uh, the question I was going to ask uh, on Jefferson Street, in 421, I think you answered it. Jefferson Street is State Highway. Correct. That's the reason. Highway 421. That's the reason it's uh, operated like it is. Yes. City don't have no 
some control over that area? Or? We can enforce the traffic regulations, <coughs> we can pass new regulations that change it from the state. All right, so from yeah. Jefferson to the bridge of city owned. No, um, Highway 421 from the bridge all the way down East Main Street and all the way up 421 and across 62 uh, is controlled by the state. So a person needs to talk to the state representative or to the city representative about how trucks turned on the, off the 421 to Jefferson Street because they can't make that turn. We have had multiple conversations with NDOT. They also have traffic engineers. Uh, they're aware of that particular intersection and they've not uh, uh, made any changes. But okay. yes, it's all controlled by NDOT. And the same way with the hilltop. Same way the across the hilltop on uh, Clifty Drive. We know it is Clifty Drive, but it's Highway 62 and 56 now. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I yeah. most of the answer right. that when you said, well, I know that was my concern. But, uh, everybody's got a, the roundabout is simple. Left has the right one. Yes. <laughs> they did change the roundabout from a two lane to a one lane, so hopefully that has helped. Like, two lanes can't go around it at the same time. You can spur off of it, but you can, only one can stay on it, one car at a time. Nobody still don't use their turn signal. They get confused people. Mm -hmm. It's just lack of knowledge of yeah. roundabouts. They're right. here to say. Roundabouts are efficient. Yeah. You know, they're used a lot across the state, particularly in central Indiana. Thanks, Shelby. Anybody else? All right, moving on. Uh, it's my honor tonight to recommend two appointments to uh, very important boards. Uh, one of the uh, recommended appointees to the tree board is here tonight. We do have a vacancy there. I'd like to introduce Jeff Matheny, who is right there. I'll tell you a little bit about Jeff, other than him being an awesome pickleball player. Uh, with the Madison Consolidated High School and uh, studied forestry in Purdue and had a illustrious career across the, the country and in 2019 moved back to Madison. He is a certified arborist and is also certified and qualified in tree risk assessment. Kathy Rolfing, who is the uh, uh, president of our tree board, has recommended um, Jeff to this position. I concur. Uh, our ordinance with regards to the tree board um, indicates that council will uh, advise and consent to my recommendation. So it's my recommendation tonight that we uh, appoint uh, Jeff to the tree board. And I would ask uh, city council to ask any questions and also your, Jeff is here to answer any questions and then take action on, on the uh, We'll entertain a motion to approve the appointment. I move we approve the appointment of Jeff Metheny to uh, the City of Madison Tree Board. I will second that motion. Any discussion from the board or council on me? All right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Jeff, thank you for agreeing to serve and, and uh, bringing your expertise to uh, uh, the tree board, which, as you know, and you sat in on the meeting the other night, takes, it, takes the trees and uh, our environment very seriously here across the city. So thank you for one, being willing to serve. I, just want, I want to yeah. say something to Jeff real quick. Um, Jeff, my dad was Bob Berry. Yes. He was good friends with your dad. Yes. And we used to go out to your place and fish in the lake. It was a great fishing spot. And I worked for your dad uh, in the summer um, in the art department. So, yes, I understand. Yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> David, David the character. Good guy. Oh, yes. Next up, uh, we do have a, as you know, a, a, I don't know, maybe a month or so ago, council approved an ordinance that created Public Arts Commission. And uh, the first step in moving forward with uh, guidelines and um, educational areas with regards to public arts is forming the board. I'm happy to recommend Ken Nyberg as the first appointment to the Public Arts Commission. Uh, Council, I think you, you also have her resume in addition to, to Jeff's. But I'll mention here that uh, and Ken couldn't be here tonight, but 
Kim currently serves as the founding executive director for the Massonary Arts Alliance and is a freelance consultant. She's a native of Nashville, Tennessee. She's held many positions in her adopted hometown of Masson, Indiana. She brings 30 years of hands-on experience in the area of downtown development, historic preservation, Main Street revitalization, organizational development, and design expertise. Uh, her work in cultural and strategic planning has helped capture and communicate the economic impact of arts as an important component of community revitalization. You have a resume with her work experience, her professional involvement, as well as her educational background. Uh, like to uh, recommend, with council's consent, Kim Nyberg's appointment to the Public Arts Commission. And I would move that we accept that recommendation. Okay, I'll second. Board any discussion or council any discussion? Sorry, it's my boards. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. All right, thank you both. Thank you, Kim and Jeff, for being willing to serve. We have a few other vacancies on boards that we will uh, be identifying uh, new members for. We'll bring those to council as appropriate. A couple of other things. Uh, I mentioned COVID earlier. Right now, there's no plans. Uh, we met with the health department. There are no plans to make any changes with regards to how outdoor festivals are being conducted. I think each of those event organizers are doing a good job with public health uh, in um, taking into consideration. We did have a, we did, we are now starting to get census information. Happy to report that contrary to other rural communities, so almost half of rural communities across the state have uh, had experienced a decline in population over the last decade. Jefferson County uh, experienced an increase of approximately 2.5% over that time period. And the city of Madison has uh, experienced an increase in population stemming a pretty long-term trend of uh, either uh, stagnant or declining population of approximately uh, almost 4%. So that's good news. Uh, that, and I think we're positioned really well with regards to uh, Madison and Jefferson County being a very attractive community for people to relocate to for a variety of reasons, but certainly in a post-COVID manner. Uh, along with that, uh, I think that also supports the application that I've talked about a few times here with our ready grants, uh, the Regional Economic, Regional Economic Accelerated Development Initiative. Uh, we did put together two plans for the Southern Indian RDA. Uh, they both scored uh, very high. Uh, our, our downtown destination development plan scored really high. We had an interview with the RDA yesterday, and so now they're in the process of finalizing the Regional Development Authority's plans that they'll submit to the state, but feel very confident that several of the initiatives we had embedded in our economic development plans will be incorporated in the regional plan. Uh, Mass and Courier did an article on I thought Bob did. Bob Dimmer did a really good job on the article in last Saturday's paper. Um, overall, $154 million of, of potential investment with quarter billion dollar of economic impact to the community and strong collaboration across the community, both downtown and the hilltop workforce as well as destination. And uh, it really is creating a, a really thoughtful but aggressive roadmap for our economic development activities for the next, uh, next three to five years. I want to mention that uh, the Board of Public Works yesterday, we took action on what I consider three major things. One was uh, uh, the agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers to enter into planning assistance contract with them for future flood risk mitigation on the Crooked Creek watershed. We've got a lot of work to do there, but uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is going to work with and assign multiple engineers and a project manager to work with the city to identify a hydraulic and hydrological uh, issues with the Kirkley Creek watershed, the water flows, discharges into those tributaries, and what we can do to uh, mitigate a future flood risk uh, in the that area again. We've had two of them in the past six years. There are some immediate steps that we're taking. Uh, we've talked a few times about the relief efforts for uh, residents who have been affected and impacted by uh, the flood, both at the local level, 
relief efforts at the local level, state level with the Indiana Department of Homeland Security, federal level with the SBA. Governor Holcomb did uh, agree, and, and because of the amount of damage, uh, passed a, uh, a disaster declaration that mirrored ours. Uh, that did trigger relief efforts by federal agencies and the uh, disaster uh, relief uh, fund. We're still working on that. We still have a long way to go um, with the tributaries and also the planning stage. But again, it, it is about taking a data-driven approach and investing in the, investing in that so that we can minimize the damage, but more importantly, uh, just the impact on human life. Uh, in those two areas that, that have been impacted. The other thing we took action on was a limited notice to proceed for designing our clean drinking water infrastructure um, plan. Uh, we, uh, we have applied for, for two grants with the State Water Infrastructure Fund, one for clean drinking water and one for storm water. They play both into the fact that City of Madison hasn't invested in its drinking water infrastructure in about 20 years, and it's long overdue, and we need to continue investing, as we just talked about, in flood risk mit uh, mitigation. So we have entered into a contract with Commonwealth Engineers to go ahead and design uh, that plan. That, uh, that plan has to be designed and permit ready by the end of the year in order to qualify for a SWIFT grant. We're not sure what amounts will be awarded. Uh, hopefully we'll find out by the end of August, we have asked Jefferson County Commissioners to consider contributing two and a half million dollars of their uh, American Rescue Plan Act monies toward that. Uh, I would ask you all to call the commissioners and ask them to support that uh, because it does affect two thirds of Jefferson County. This is not a City of Madison drinking water uh, project. It is a Jefferson County drinking water project because the City of Madison provides clean water to uh, two-thirds of Jefferson County. So please call your commissioners and ask them to support that. And lastly, um, uh, Chief Wallace had presented and was approved uh, as an important initiative of our, of our public safety um, public safety planning, a uh, new standard operating procedure to uh, recruit and fund a part-time uh, police force uh, to fill in and help leverage our full-time merit-based uh, police department. So uh, I want to thank Chief Wallace for his thoughtfulness and that plan. It's been a key initiative of ours in the public safety realm, and it, and it will also allow us to uh, have a very economical uh, but effective way uh, to supplement our existing police department uh, with, with trained, uh, credentialed police officers rather than a, uh, a reserve force that basically ha or has essentially basic, uh, pre-basic training. Those are the three major things that came out of the Board of Public Works, but uh, nonetheless, it was a uh, very important and productive, productive meeting. So uh, Mindy gave you an outline on where we're at budget-wise, and uh, sounds like our first reading of our budget ordinance uh, may occur as soon as our, our next uh, council meeting, which will be September the 7th. Council, I am uh, happy to answer any questions you all might have or anything you want to share with the community. Before we adjourn, our next meeting is going to be Tuesday, September the 7th. Labor Day is, uh, is a holiday in between there, and I hope everybody gets a chance to get out and enjoy Riverfest this weekend, right, Jim? Riverfest, absolutely. Riverfest, yes. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. All right. We'll see you next time. You know what's funny? When running for council he thought he called met with me he wanted to talk to me about the tire tax tim he wanted me to 